Uncle Duck and I share a special bond. You know, I was able to have him in my life when I was very young, basically from birth. Plus, he was young, like when I was six years old, when I was like 20. And uh, I just have so many memories. Uh, I guess my first and foremost memory is that everybody should have an Uncle Doc. Uncle Duck, as we affectionately call him. But uh, other than that, Uncle Doc was just so much fun. You know, when he came around, he had a way he dressed and all that, and he walked in the house, there's always that smile, you know. Uh, I had uh, memories, a lot of memories from childhood. One of my favorites was, uh, we used to go out to Daddy Buddy, uh, my mama and Uncle Donald and Mark's grandfather, Talbot's father, in the country, uh, I think it's Lexburg, Louisiana. He had a farm on 40 acres, big, fast lane, man, and we go there because run around the kids and all. Long story short, I knew at some point Uncle Donald's was gonna saddle up the horse, uh, uh, Sam Jones. <laughs> so man, I would hardly sleep that, that night. And I'd hear him steering about, and I'd get up here up throw on my clothes, man. Uncle Donald, I'm coming with you. He said, well, come on. And he'd ride, I'd ride on the back of the horse, and he on the front, and we'd gallop, man, up uh, on the uh, levee, go down to the Tefuncta River, Tefalaya River. Walk, you know, walk around with the horse there and all, and, uh, I'll never forget uh, when I was about 10, I guess. He saddled up Sam Jones and he saddled up the Mayor Mary. And I'm like, well, somebody else coming? What he said, you get on Mary Slim, that's what he's called. Got, oh man, that was like like I was in a Formula One race or something like that, you know. <laughs> but um, other things uh, that stand out in my mind, Uncle Donald was so dependable. Uh, I likened him to a, a character in one of my favorite movies, uh, Pulp Fiction. Fiction. And the boss called this guy called the wolf. The wolf. The wolf's gonna come and fix it. I remember I was uh, just out of college and I had a girlfriend. Uh, she was a senior at Southern University in Baton Rouge. And I drove up there and my car broke down as it so, so, so often did back then. <laughs> and I got it towed to a, a, a car repair place. I called Uncle Donald on the phone, I said, I said, Uncle, I need you, I'm stuck in Baton Rouge, blah, 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 blah. I'll be there, Slim, I swear, 55 minutes. Woo, bam, right down the place. <laughs> then on the way back home, we stopped, got a drink and all this <laughs> Then he brought me back up there to go pick up my car once it got fixed, you know, and just, you know, was, something happened once, uh, I don't know if it was something, but school, I needed $100. I was $100 short to come home throws out some money. See if you can find it in there, Slim. Of course he's got like, you know, a couple of thousand or whatever. <laughs> but just, i never forget those laughing eyes. You know, he kind of smiled through his eyes a little more than just his mouth. And if you brought him a, a seafood platter for lunch or something, how appreciative he was. You know, he said, man, this is a wonderful blessing. But a great person and, uh, yeah, but just a, a great person with a great heart just a larger than life figure, a larger than life like a legend, and uh, I'm going to miss it. Hold on. But nobody that I idolized more than your daddy because he really helped raise me. He really was the, the, the reason I was able to negotiate my life in a better stead because he would tell me, oh, don't do this, don't do that, you know, you know, don't hang with this, don't hang with that. And, and the kicks, I you know, didn't want me to hang with that. Because as soon as we, I came, I was in my freshman year at Illinois, I came home and I had my mama's car that day and I drove by uh, some somewhere uh, one of the joints and I saw a duck in them and they all piled into my mama's car. Now yeah, I mean we had about six or seven dudes in the car. My mama little small fair lady. Where we go? Where we going, duck? Uh, go by Scotty. Scotty! All I ever heard about how notorious Scott was. 
So your daddy tell me, Bo, we're going in here. Hold on to my hold on to my back, my back, uh, my back and my belt. Stay right behind me. So we go up there and as the duck walks in the joint, the whole looks like the partner of the Red Sea. <laughs> and all his authorized black and, and tax and and uh, uh, big old, what's the big old dude used to be with Duck and them? He, they was in the entourage, you know, they walk in. So soon as everybody recognizable in the group pair, Red Sea comes back together. <laughs> you know, you know, Moses was not there for dinner. So the Red Sea comes back together. So in my, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm little Lord, and I'm in my little Lord the Funk Rush. <laughs> so ain't nobody recognized me as one of the thugs. That was in the grad in the group. So I'm, 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 you know, I'm meandering through the group. Excuse me, pardon me, you know, people like him. There's one dude. Said, bro, why you want to be bumping up? I said, man, I said it's you. You don't be bumping all up against me. So, oh look, you know, everybody, you know, they gonna be, they gonna be in some, in some acting it. So I just got my pose, you know. Uncle Percy taught us how to box. So I, Boxing was never one of my problems. Right. So I'm standing there and I'm about, you know, I'm ready, you know, for whatever you do. Let him make the first move. Duck walks back in there, because he heard the, 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 the chaos. He comes back in. Boy, you got a problem? I say, yeah, I got a problem with this dude right here. The dude looks up, oh, Duck, oh, oh Duck, I didn't, I didn't mean nothing. I didn't, I didn't. And Duck said, that's my cousin. Oh, man, oh, bro. He was going to be my partner. Uh, oh, bro. He said, five drinks for everybody. God, they had, look, they had, more, they had more people in there than you got hair on your head. And you got thick hair on your head. They had more people in there got hair. That dude must have spent a million dollars buying everybody. Buy everybody, everybody get a drink. What I say, God. I look at that nigga and say, man, what kind of fool you got? If you had any kind of problem, you went to Donald Jackson. I said, boy, you got some clout with you. You got some mess with you. But that's the way, you know, and he and he was always there to give me the right information and to direct me. And like I said, I I didn't have anybody I was closer to than him. And I deal it, I'm gonna deal with this every day from now on. And as long as I got on this later time. I, I need his, I'm gonna miss his guidance and direction. And it's just his camaraderie. And he, did, he was just always a good person to be around. Always brought jokes and clarity, and clarity to the situation. He always had a good time. Man. Hi, my name is Mace Hibbard, and I'm a good friend of Tyrone Jackson here in Atlanta, and I've been trying to put my thoughts together about Mr. Jackson, and it's funny, I was thinking about it to myself. I've only, I don't know his name, because I've only ever called him Mr. Jackson or Dad. Um, I don't remember the exact year that I met him, but it was, he had come to town to hear Tyrone play music and and I was lucky enough to be on the gig with Tyrone and it started as Mr. Jackson that day and I think it ended with dad because uh, he and I hit it off uh, immediately and uh, mostly because we were teasing Tyrone and he was like you know what you're just like one of my sons the way you interact with Tyrone and ever since that that time uh he and I, uh, he and I were just on the same, the same wavelength. And every time I talked to Tyrone, I would ask about how, how dad was doing. And Tyrone said he always asked how I was doing. And, uh, 
uh, just know that my heart and my love is with you and all your family. And uh, I will certainly miss miss Dad. And uh, I'm sorry because uh, he and I had talked and Tyrone had talked and we were all going to, Tyrone and I were going to make a road trip to New Orleans. And uh, Dad was going to take us around and, and show us show us all the good spots in New Orleans. And I'm sorry we never got to do that. But uh, once again, my love is with you and all the family. And uh, I'll be praying for you. I remember Uncle Duck, but I remember him coming here. I don't know if he lived here or what, but he was always here when Granny used to keep us, Granny and Grandpa. And he would, came in, man, and I said, who is this wild dude? You know, <laughs> coming back. Man, we had so much fun. Right. And I could fast forward. I remember him uh, teaching me checkers as a youngster. Mm -hmm. uh, showing me some boxing moves. Doing my taxes since I started working, like 15, 16 years old. Always doing my taxes. Um, throughout my life, I, I cannot remember a time where I didn't see Uncle Doug. Right. You know, all over. And um, I can remember going places like around the corner of Henry Dejois' house. His daddy owned the Louisiana Weekly. And me and Mr. Dejois were talking. This man was. Uh, a walking encyclopedia of New Orleans history, of, especially uh, particularly African American history. Mm -hmm. And he was t we was talking, and he said, "My son says uh, you Donald's nephew." I said, "Yeah, uh, Donald Ambo or Donald Jacks." He said, "He used to do my he does my tag." Mm -hmm. I said, "No, that's my uncle Duck." Right. He said, "Yeah, from back here." I said, "Yeah." So he did Mr. Dejois taxes. Wow. Mr. Dejois owned the Louisiana Week. Yes, Probably indeed. that African American uh, newspaper. Yes, indeed. I was telling uh, Little Donald how, how complex Uncle Duck was. You know, I, I remember Uncle Duck as a little bitty boy uh, watching the race car drive. I said, Uncle Duck, that boy, what you watching that for? And he ex tried to, he explained it to me. You know? mm -hmm. There's more to it than just the cars going around the tracks, fuel, or drafting. He taught me, like, a car gets behind a car, mm -hmm. it's drafting. Mm -hmm. and, and Engine size, the different, you know, I can't remember all that stuff. Different type of engines. Uh, he and his friends, they used to uh, work on cars mm -hmm. and take engines out and put engines in, rebuild engines, rebuild transmission. And he would let you know what he uh, knew and didn't know. Mm -hmm. For example, if he didn't know something, he, he'd bring along techs who knew more about right. certain things than he did. Right. He'd uh, bring along somebody else, Mr. Wolfrey, Breezy, we call him. Mm -hmm. Man, Uncle Duck. Then he, I used to talk to him, he played music, he played clarinet. But then he got away from that and wanted to do other things, you know, just grow up and be a, a little boy and play athletic. Mm -hmm. Uncle Duck did a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And everywhere you went, people knew him, liked him, and respected him. Yeah, like the perfect uncle. Mm -hmm. Never discouraged him, never talked bad, and treated everybody differently and loved everybody uh, similarly. And he was the kind of uncle who would, uh, he never had a favorite. He was, uh, he was consistent, you can always count on him. And uh, he was selfless in terms of how he treated you. He always put others before himself. In my experiences with him, you know? Right. Now I'm not gonna talk about some of the other stuff. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but um, yeah, I, I realized some things then. Mm. And you know, it's part of life, but I was telling somebody about him, and I said, the Bible says uh, 310, and, Three score and ten, 70 years, and you're blessed. You're highly favored beyond that. He had 10 years out. I remember one story. I had to go to, to the ear, eyes, and ear, eyes, nose, and throat clinic on Basin, Tulane, and uh, Canal, that area. Mm -hmm. And I was here. And Uncle Ducky had a fast little car, I think a Ford Fairlane, a Falcon or something. Mm -hmm. and, and he drove me and Granny 
to the doctor. Granny was taking me to the doctor. Mm -hmm. And man, it felt like we got there in two minutes from this house. <laughs> and I'm just looking up. Granny's just this calm, cool, calm, and collective. And I'm back there. I'm saying, man, this man gonna kill us. <laughs> it felt like he's going about 100 miles an hour. And we got there, and Granny just looked up. I said, I said to myself, Granny, you didn't, you didn't check him or told him. And uh, dropped us off, then he came pick us up. Dutifully. Dutifully. 